In this segment, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on why we are trying to do these community groups. What is God calling us to? Now, it is, uh, when you study sacred scripture, especially when you get into the writings of Pope John Paul II and his Theology of the Body and his other earlier work, Love and Responsibility, you really see this flourishing of the church's biblical teaching on the need for um, true authentic community. And it, it starts as early as the first you know, couple pages of Genesis. Um, in Genesis chapter two, verse 18, this is before the fall. This is one of the things that when I was doing my research for this, I never really noticed this because I had read it so many times. You know, you're reading Genesis, the six days, you flip over, it is good, it is good, it is good, everything's good. And then you get to the, the famous part in Genesis 2.18 where it says, it is not good for man to be alone. And I had heard that before and I'd said that before and it's a cornerstone of Pope John Paul II's teaching on the theology of the body. But what I really didn't connect was, here is something before the fall that is not good. And it is the experience of being alone or, or, or being isolated. And when you think about it from that perspective, if we are created in the image and likeness of God, God himself is not alone, right? He is father, he is son, and he is the bond of love between father and son, the Holy Spirit. He's the lover, the beloved, and the love that unites them. And if we're created in that image and likeness, then us being alone is not good. And so that's the, the, the unique thing about the story of Genesis and the creation narrative is before the fall, there was something, it wasn't sinful, right? But it wasn't good, why? Because we are made for others, right? Man can only find himself through a sincere gift of himself, as Vatican II says. That, that phrase from Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, one of the documents of Vatican II, was the cornerstone of all of Pope John Paul II's thinking. His theology, his philosophy, that's what propelled him to be a saint. He viewed the human community and our social interconnections as being one of the primary ways that we manifest God's love to each other, right? And that became, again, the cornerstone of the theology of the body, the sincere gift of oneself. Um, when you look in uh, the New Testament, right, you see Jesus saying, for wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I present in the midst of them, right? So there, it's not that Jesus isn't gonna listen to the person praying alone, but that there is, some, you know, like he's just gonna pretend like they're not there, but that there is something unique and particular about the Christian community, about two or three gathering in the name of Jesus Christ, that he is present with the community, with those gathered, more in, a, in just a uniquely different way than he is with someone alone. That is to say that it is the community, especially the one community rooted in what we would call his divine sonship, rooted as children of the Father, that that expresses the fullness of who we are called to be as men and women, right? Who we are called to be in God's image and likeness. Now, um, the cool thing is as we transfer this, uh, as kind of like the New Testament continues to unfold, um, we have the famous phrase in John chapter 13 where he says, a new commandment I give you, and this is the new commandment, it's three words, love one another. Love one another. Yeah, the New Testament is full, and this is, I tell people to do this sometimes, it's a great Bible study. You go to like one of those like biblegateway.com or something like that, and you just type in one another, and you hit search and you click the New Testament. The New Testament is full. You could almost say that it is a theology of one anothering one another, right? It's support one another, encourage one another, care for one another, build up one another, bless one another, and over and over again, love one another. Whether it's John in the Gospel of John or in the um, first and second John, or if it's Paul in Romans and first Thessalonians, it's all over in the New Testament. In fact, you could say that the distinctive characteristic of early Christianity was they were all about one anothering one another, whether that was support, care, encouragement, love. Um, so, but this is a unique thing about Jesus' commandments, back up. I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so are you to love one another. This is how all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, right? So he says, first, love one another. Second, not with your love, which is uh, you know, selfish and petty and conditional, but love one another with my love right, which is unconditional, which is selfless, which is never uh, pathetic or, you know, uh, anything like that. His love is just pure gratuitousness. Love one another as I have loved you. But the unique thing is this, the next step is what? That the essence of evangelization is Christian love for one another. He says, and everyone will know you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another, right? 
That's where it all begins for us in the Christian life. And you see this in the early church. In the book of Acts, they talk about this, especially in Acts, the famous verse, chapter and verse 242. That verse has captivated, you know, Catholics and Protestants, people founding religious orders, to people starting church plants for evangelical communities to this day. It's Acts 242 and following that have changed a lot of people's lives because this is something so radical. And this is what it says. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in one another's homes. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This statement comes right after the famous phrase, And on that day, they added 3,000 to their number. So they baptized 3,000 people, right? Brought them into the church. And then right after that, this new community of 3,000 plus people are meeting together in the temple, in large group bodies, and then they're meeting in each other's homes. They have the large group experience, this public sense of belonging, this big group belonging, but they also had the more, um, the more intimate encounters of like more personal belonging within each other's homes, right? You can't fit 3,000 people in each other's homes. I mean, maybe here in the woodlands you could, but uh, so the idea is that they invested in the communal life as just as much as they invested in the apostles' teaching. Right? And that's crucial for understanding the way they did community. And I want to take this even further. Um, in St. John 4.10, he goes, I mean, this is, this is how far the love of one another goes. No one has ever seen God. This is how it starts out. First John chapter 4, verse 10 and following. No one has ever seen God. Yet, if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is brought to perfection in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us and that he has given to us of his spirit. Think about the the radicalness of those those words. Jesus said, people will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And St. John, the beloved disciple says, listen, no, it's people will see the face of God by the way you love one another. And you look at our communities that are, you know, right? We feel like we're almost too big. We have so much going on in our individual lives. The very thought of giving, of adding another thing once a week, once every other week is a burden. Like it is exhausting to think about, I gotta do what now? What's the one more thing to my calendar, to my kid's calendar? But we know this, we know this, that today more than any other time in uh, American history, more adults are saying that they feel alone, feel isolated, they feel alienated from other people that are their peers. More adults are reporting that they don't have close friends, that they don't have people that they can share their life with or the most important parts of their life. They have friends who are more like acquaintances, coworkers, but not someone who we would say is tracking along with life with them. And so the purpose of community groups is to try to create that uniquely Christian environment. Now, what are we not trying to do? We are not trying to make everyone, if you were to join a group, a small group, we don't want them to force you into like, hey, you must now be best friends, right? We don't want you to share your entire life story with everyone everywhere all the time, all the intimate details moments. We're going to get into how to have a proper Christian community, right? How to really share. But there's three things that are absolutely fundamental in order to grow in Christian community, especially through this, this infrastructure that we're building called community groups and small group discipleship. And that's these three things, really simple. Show up, that's important. You can't, you can't, uh, you know, like, what is it? Uh, uh, showing up is nine tenths of the battle. I made that part up. Uh, show up, join in, right? Don't sit there with your arms crossed, staring, you know, with your head, you know, back half asleep. Show up, join in and be real. Don't be someone you're not. Don't do all the fake, you know, posing and whatnot. Don't try to impress everyone with how whole you are and all these different things. You gotta join in, you gotta show up, you gotta join in, and you gotta be real. You gotta have some skin in the game. You, you, know, the, you know, many people have heard the phrase, um, was it the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? If we are, uh, feel like we don't have a lot of friends, we don't have a lot of support, we don't have people who know us and care about us, and yet we're still going to check out when it comes time for those moments to actually bring a deeper connection, we're never going to have those. We are never going to have intimate fellowship. We're never going to have community. If our church gets bigger and bigger, we're just going to feel more and more lost. And so the goal is if you show up, if you join in, and if you be real, and we're gonna break all that down, 
If you do those three things, that is creating, it's not going to force, it's not going to be automatic, but that's creating the possibility, the potential to have deeper relationships based on Christ that are meaningful and that can come and help you truly be care and support for you when you need it the most. Now, um, Oh, I want to get in now to the type of community that we want to build, because I know sometimes people, they get nervous when they think like, hey, I want you to come sit in a circle with, you know, some of them are strangers, some of them people you know, and I want you to share your feelings, right? I would be horrified if someone said, I don't like hugging men, like it's a whole thing I have, I don't want to share my feelings with strangers. Um, but I know this, I've experienced small group life twice in my, twice in my life. I had a community in college, um, it was my household, AMDG was a group of men, about 40 of us, and all 40 were, I was really close to most of them, many of them, but there was a core group of men that I gave permission to call me out, that I gave permission to challenge me, that I gave permission, and they did the same to me so that we could actually grow in holiness, grow in maturity, grow in moral virtue, because we had people that loved us enough to correct us in love, right? So I knew that they didn't have an ulterior motive, that they weren't acting on pride, that they weren't being jerks, they really wanted the best for me. But here's what we're trying to do. Uh, And this is gonna get a little bit technical, and I love this kind of aspect of this. There was a man uh, named Joseph Myers, he's an author of a book, talking about um, the, the desire to belong today that's felt so intensely and in many cases left unresolved. And he starts struggling with why are so many community groups and small groups and stuff like that at these mega churches, why are they failing? Why do they only have a small percentage? And he, and he realized that um, he used this famous architect's four ways of understanding spatial relationships, which is public space, think of like, um, uh, like an arena, like a football arena, going to the Texan stadium. That's a public space, right? You go there, it's not, it's not meant to be, you know, you're not looking at each other, you're not doing prolonged eye contact with each other. It's just a big public space where, you, where it's something external that you're all focusing on. But then you narrow it even further. Think of like a party at New Year's Eve where it's people you know, people you don't know. That's a social space. That you're sharing like snapshots of yourself. You're letting your life, not just that external thing, whether it's your job or whatever, but you're sharing aspects of your life. You're talking about that vacation you took and you're talking about this or that, your kids, you know, you're sharing these snap, uh, snapshots, but you're not getting super deep, right? Even the way of eye contact, right? So you're making eye contact with a person, but it's not prolonged eye contact where we just stare. And that would make people in social circumstances, right? That makes them uncomfortable. Like, oh man, you, have you ever been at a party where someone just locks in on you and you're like desperate to get out of there? That's because they're operating out of the next phase, right? They're trying to enter into personal space. And you don't want that close personal space. You want the social space. You want like, hey, this is a party. I want to go now. (laughs) Right? And and so that's this experience of these different things. Uh, The next one is personal space. And personal space is, it's even less people, right? Think of it as like a dinner, right? So you got the arena, you got the party, you got the dinner. More people, that's where they know more about you. That's where you share more than just snapshots. It's, they know huge chunks of your life. They understand a lot of your intentions, a lot of the stuff. Um, they know a lot of details about you, but it's not at that last level, the, what we call the naked level. They haven't seen you naked, literally and metaphorically, right? So that last level is called the intimate space, right? That's reserved for one, two, or maybe three people kind of at the most. And so the problem with a lot of small groups at a lot of churches is they kind of want everyone, they think everyone should just hop, skip, and jump straight to the intimate stage, right? And you don't even know some of these people, and you're just really there for the, for the uh, you know, the Fritos and the chips and, uh, you know, the Fanta drink, you know, and you're just sitting there, and you wanted it to be a light social atmosphere. You wanted it to be social, but all of a sudden other people share things that are insanely deep, and you're like, oh no, are we going there? Right, so what are, what are we trying to co- communicate here? At St. Anthony's and for community groups in general, uh, intimacy is, is not the appropriate space. That intimate connection, the intimate sense of belonging, that's not appropriate within small group. So you don't want to share those raw, naked aspects of your life, your history, your personality. That's for maybe a person or two that you bond with in community group that in a different place. That, that's not really the right place. Um, we also don't want it to be public. Mass is kind of the public space. Mass is where we all go and we're all kind of facing the same direction. We're all on the same team, rah, 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 and that's kind of like like that's where we, and, and it's important. This is the thing that people disregard. They think public space isn't important. 
most of our most healthy connections are public space connections, right? Think of the guy that travels to Notre Dame, his alma mater for, you know, certain football games, right? He doesn't need to know the names of everyone around him, but chances are they can form very healthy bonds while they're there. People that go to like quilting conventions once a year, they don't need to follow up with phone calls and emails and all that stuff. They don't have to become Facebook friends. But when they meet up, that is a meaningful, important connection that people have. The public space is very important, but, but in public space, you're not sharing aspects of your life with each other. You're not tracking along to those things that matter most. It's an external thing that you share that's good. We need those in our lives. But community groups are meant to take it to the next step. And the next step is either social, right, where you're sharing those snapshots, or personal, where they get to know a little bit more about your life. And so what we're trying to do with community groups is to bridge the gap between the public spaces, the public relationships you might have here at church, your public sense of belonging to this church or to whatever church you belong to, and to bridge it into something that is more akin to families, you know, that is more akin to a brother-sister relationship kind of thing with your fellow parishioners. Because that's the goal. The goal is to bring people into a sense of when they walk in here, they don't think of this place as their bedroom, but they do think of this place as their home away from home, right? That's the appropriate way. And so for small groups, that's the way that we build these bridges to create it. And it's critical for Christians. Um, and what I wanna do is I wanna summarize, as we end here, I wanna summarize what we call the five biblical purposes. This originally comes up from Rick Warren, famous evangelical pastor out of Saddleback, but it is, <laughs> there's 100% correlation with Catholic teaching. The famous uh, six tasks of catechesis, this lines up perfectly with that. So don't feel like, oh, well, it's not Catholic enough. That's silly. These are principles that every Catholic can view. And, and we wanna break them up into two categories, and we're just gonna um, touch on them lightly. Every small group experience, in order to grow in your faith, right, in order to really grow, not just to come to church once a week and treat the priest like a sacrament dispenser and get our Eucharist and check off the checklist and then go, like, right now, seminaries are trying to form their priests to not be mere sacramental uh, functionaries. They want their priests to immerse themselves in the life of the community, but they know as these churches get bigger and bigger, what happens? that they just need the sacraments. Give me my sacrament, I'm gonna go. So how do we counteract that? By building these communities of social and personal belonging to the parish. So um, in each small group, what we're gonna hope for everyone to accomplish is a, is, is a balance, right? Um, and these are the, the types of things. So there's three under the inside, how we focus with each other. Uh, number one is worship, right? Number one, one of the purposes of your life is to worship God. That is a total purpose of your life. And it doesn't mean just liturgy. It means worshiping God in prayer, worshiping God in your house, in your labors, and the work that you do, and the kids that you raise, and whatever else. So the idea is that we're worshiping God. When we come together in a community group, we are coming together. We're, we're not just opening in a, in a mandatory opening and closing prayer, like a bookend to a meeting, right? All right, quickly, we'll do the sign of the cross. You know. No, it's entering into prayer, sharing that public or, or that uh, social belonging through prayer, sharing little snapshots of our lives that we need through prayer. That begins people coming, getting their hearts connected. Right, because in the Acts of the Apostles, it says that they were of one mind and one heart. And the best way to do that is to worship God together, right? The other inside thing is fellowship. Fellowship is not socializing. Socializing is important, but it's not enough in the Christian, Christian world. Fellowshipping is taking that to a deeper level, right? It's not just sitting there and drinking beer or drinking, you know, like having a bunch of drinks and eating snack food and just talking the whole time and then saying, oh, you know what? We're good. We finished. You know, we wrap up with a closing prayer, a little glory be on the side, and then we're done. Fellowship means a lot more, and it's kind of the goal of every small group is to build bridges of friendship with one another. It is Christians living in friendship to the point where we are willing to sacrifice of ourselves for the sake of, of the other, right? That's a deeper form of fellowship. Um, and then last is discipleship. The word disciple comes from the, the Latin word dastipuli, meaning students, right? One who sits at the feet of the master. And with Jesus Christ, we might be apostles and prophets and bishops and priests and professional church fancy lay people and missionaries and all this stuff, but we never stop, no matter how mature we are, no matter if we're canonized, we never cease to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That we sit at the feet of the mass and we follow him. And that involves study, that involves learning, that involves growing in emotional and intellectual maturity in our faith, right? So it's all about that. It's all about following Jesus. And then the next part, outside. How do we as believers relate to those on the outside? And those are two categories, service and evangelism. 
right? In Catholic circles, we're pretty good on service. We got food pantries. We got so many St. Vincent de Paul societies and churches all over the world. We're pretty good on the service thing. But the other issue is evangelism, that these two things need to actually become one thing of blending together the aspect of serving other people for and out of the love of Jesus Christ. Evangelism means making explicit the gospel that we're proclaiming, but it does not mean, um, number one, it doesn't mean that we badger people. It doesn't mean that we lecture people. Evangelism means basically that we're loving people into the kingdom of heaven. Why? By being there for them. That's how we do it. By being there, by supporting one another, encouraging one another, um, you know, s- serving one another through, especially when they're in times of need. These are the things that we can do together, right? In small group, every small group can have these aspects of worship, fellowship, discipleship, right? Studying the word of God, praying together, um, and then service and evangelism, creating opportunities where as a group, so it's not so scary, we as Catholics can evangelize, right? So this is the type of community that we're going to build. This is the goal of Christian, of uh, community groups and Christian small groups is that we're trying to build a culture where friends in the name of Christ can grow one another's faith. God bless.